Our next speaker hails from Winnipeg, Manitoba. And uh, he went to school, albeit briefly, in uh, Toronto at Ryerson. But uh, I didn't meet him uh, until I uh, bumped into him in London, England, where he was rooming with and I was calling on a very beautiful Irish girl called Brenda. Uh, I subsequently offered both of them jobs and uh, both of them turned me down. Um, Tyler said he was fed up with television, so he went off and got himself shot in Afghanistan. Uh, and it was while he was recovering from that particular episode that he dreamt up a thing called wallpaper. Uh, wallpaper is a magazine of uh, style and consumerism and uh, and uh, a lifestyle that is directed at a group of international sophisticates in the business of magazines. It's considered the most successful launch of a new magazine in the last generation. Tyler Brule. Good afternoon. Uh, Moses didn't really leave me very much to talk about now, um, so thank you. Um, perhaps I'll ask for that job in television after I get off stage. Uh, indeed, I, I was born in Winnipeg um, and really grew up shuttling between Montreal and Toronto. Um, my father uh, was a professional football player with the CFL. Um, my mother uh, is an artist. Um, of course, it made sense that I would end up being uh, a journalist who would go off to Afghanistan in 1994 um, to take a rather bizarre assignment to, to cover the activities of Médecins Sans Frontières. And there's, I guess, a number of themes I wanted to discuss today. Um, Mr. Zneimer touched on the point about the fact that I was, I was tired of television, and this was probably the mid-1990s, and I think many will relate to the story in the room. Growing up um, in Canada, um, in a world where there clearly aren't as many channels as there are now. Uh, I was always fascinated um, with watching the national, um, with watching CTV National News, coming to Toronto at a young age and watching Channel 57. Um, I believe it was 79 as well for a time as well. Um, and that's really dating me. I, at a very early age, decided that uh, I didn't uh, I, I thought about being an architect, and I thought about being a number of things, but uh, I set my sights on the anchor desk and decided that I wanted to read the news. And uh, I thought, well, I could go about this two ways. I could obviously you know, um, perhaps go to Saskatchewan or go back to Manitoba and work my way up through the farm leagues and uh, eventually get back to Toronto and then, of course, get a call from uh, a major network and find my way uh, to New York and get that fantastic job at ABC or NBC or CBS. <laughs> By the mid-1990s, though, um, I wasn't interested in doing any of that, and I had I'd spent some time, obviously, at the BBC, and, uh, and curiously had, had actually thought I would go to the BBC and you know, work my way up as a researcher and producer. And um, as it happened, I got off the plane in Manchester and was offered a job on air right away, which in a very curious way, I think, spoiled me. But I guess from afar, I watched what was happening on um, the airwaves in North America and just saw this continual dumbing down of product. And it was that point that I decided I, I, television was just not interesting anymore. And I, I really was appalled by the state of, of television, uh, particularly news gathering. And I focused my efforts on um, print at that point, um, and a bit of radio as well, doing some things for the BBC World Service. But an assignment in, in 94 took me to, um, to Kabul, uh, where I was covering the activities of Médecins Sans Frontières. And uh, as it happened, uh, I, uh, with my colleagues, we were ambushed the second day that we were in Kabul. Uh, our car was hit 39 times, and I was, I was shot twice. And, uh, and my interpreter was shot through the back of the head. And uh, just a small, uh, just to rewind, Afghanistan in 1994 was um, about 
a year, nine months, sort of you know, pre pre Taliban, uh, and of course it was this was post the Russian pull. So the city had descended into about six or seven different factions fighting for control, six or seven defined factions fighting for fighting for control of the city. Um, I was very fortunate. Um, of course, uh, I I had a bullet I got bullets through both arms and. Um, perhaps as a bridge to what happened in the discussions this morning and um, the gentleman before I had um, I lost, I was left-handed and lost the functional use of, of, of my left hand and uh, I was evacuated back to, to London and spent a long time in hospital and um, I guess I felt very sorry for myself um, for a number of reasons and it, it went back to I guess looking at media companies and, uh, and the people that I took this assignment for. And I went to Afghanistan because I believed that there was a story to be told at that time. Uh, it, it had become at that point obviously the Forgotten War and, and I think newspapers in the UK at any rate were still keen on um, I think telling the story. And I've always had a strong belief in reportage and I felt that even at that time it was a dying art and it was certainly um, a, a form of of really storytelling that was starting to dim in the media. So I was sitting in hospital and was wondering what I should do next. And I guess the first thing that came to me was that, well, I didn't want to be part of a big media company. Uh, and why? Because as a freelancer, none of the companies wanted to pay me any type of compensation. And it was very difficult to get any type of reasonable insurance as a freelancer to go, out Afga to, to go to Afghanistan. So I thought, I want to perhaps go into business for myself and really invest um, in journalism and, and really invest in the editorial process. Uh, the second thing was by the time I got to the hospital, the doctors had said, you know what, you should probably try cooking because if you're gonna start using your right hand, it's very good for your motor skills, et cetera, et cetera, aside from the fact that I might chop my fingers off as well. But I, I was walking down King's Road one day and I stumbled um, you know, upon a newsstand and my mother had flown over from Toronto and uh, had, had found a, a nice townhouse for me in Chelsea. And of course, in typical English fashion, it was all peach and there was peach carpeting in the bathrooms and there was peach carpeting up the walls in the kitchen <laughs> and um, very hygienic and, and, and English. And that had to be, um, of course, sorted out as well. So I was sitting there thinking, well, I have this space that needs to be redefined and I should probably start cooking, and I knew that I liked travel and I liked storytelling. Um, and I was looking around, there was no magazine that was really doing that, and it was that I felt was also talking to a male reader as much as a female reader. And I'd been completely teetotal to that time, I never really drank very much, but after I was off the drugs, um, <laughs> the doctor said, Do you know what, you know, occasionally you can have a little drink if you want. And uh, I found that vodka, cranberry, and orange juice um, was a fantastic combination. And so I spent the whole summer of 1994 uh, recuperating in the garden um, and thinking up sort of crazy ideas. And one day, a friend came by and he said, uh, Tyler, you know, what, what's gonna happen next? And I said, well, you know, I, I've got this idea for a magazine, um, Interiors Entertaining Travel. And, uh, you know, I said, that's, sort of the basis and, and the ground for, groundwork for what the title will be about. And he said, well, if you could sum it up in one sentence or one phrase, what would it be? And I said, well, I said it's a magazine about the stuff that surrounds you. And another drink later, and he said, well, <laughs> what surrounds you? And I said, well, wallpaper surrounds me. And uh, that led to a phone call the next morning to my lawyer and, uh, and the start of um, the brand that um, many people have come to, to know and love. Uh, if we fast forward, that was, um, that was obviously uh, in 94. By, by 96, we had launched the magazine, and four issues later, we sold it, curiously enough, to Time Warner. Um, and I don't want to say that I sold my soul, but uh, it was an extraordinary rescue. And uh, for pretty much the last five years, it's, um, it's been an amazing relationship. Off the side of that, and um, I'm not sure my name was up there before, it said Wink Media. Wink um, was a small business we launched in 1998 as a a small agency, um, it was really this little node that had grown off the side of wallpaper because there was all kinds of people calling us from retail companies or grocery stores or hotel groups saying, we want to find an architect to design our new hotels, who should it be? Uh, could, we, could you tell us you know, which photographer should shoot our next campaign? And we said, well, 
there comes a point when you can give out information as a magazine. There comes a point when you actually start have to, you have to start producing invoices uh, for this information. And it became a little bit difficult, I think, within this environment and within a journalistic environment to do that. So we, we formed this separate company. We started doing things like magazines for Selfridges department store in London, um, and we started working with a brand like Puma um, on some marketing initiatives for them, and this sort of carried on. And gradually the business, 98, 99, 2000, has been growing, and it went from sort of two people to 10 people to 20 people, um, and has really been taking on a life of its own. And I've had a fantastic run the last few years, and it was quite interesting, about two summers ago, I was lying on my uh, dock in, in Sweden and um, was looking. Uh, the years have been good to me at Wallpaper. Uh, and I was lying back with my entertaining editor, Melina, and we were looking up at the clouds. And um, we'd moved on from Absolute and Cranberry by that point. I think we were, um, it was a good Spanish rose. And Melina said, Ty, she goes, if you weren't doing this right now, what would you be doing? If you just had to jack it all in at Wallpaper. And I said, you know, Melina, I said, I think I'd like to run an airline. And she said, well, if you could run an airline, what airline would it be? And I said, I have to be Swiss Air. And uh, curiously enough, um, the, the horrific autumn that um, the world went through last year, um, one of the most challenging events um, for me was, was actually the collapse of, of Swiss Air because it was it represented so many things, and I think it was a brand, and I think so much that of what I've been talking about so far is, is really about um, a commitment to uh, quality products, um, a commitment to talking to a consumer and, and really looking them in the eye, and sometimes talking over their heads as well. And I saw this amazing brand just disintegrate, and, and I thought, you know, as much as everyone should be able to fly it at a decent price, I felt that there was something amazing about this really iconic company. And, and I was monitoring the Swiss newspapers, and it just became this extraordinary blame game between banks and various cantons blaming one another, Geneva saying it was Zurich's fault, Zurich saying it was Basel's fault, et cetera, et cetera. I decided to pen an article um, in one of the big Swiss Sunday papers, and uh, I wrote a 12-point recovery plan as to how they could um, turn the airline around and, um, and resurrect it. And uh, I was very critical of the company which came in. It was basically what has happened is that the Swiss Air brand and all of their aircraft were then transferred to Crossair, which was the regional carrier. And uh, then the regional carrier started running the entire business, and they got rid of maybe about a third of the aircraft of the Swiss Air Fleet, merged the whole thing together. But the idea was that the brand was going to be called Crossair. And um, I said, this is absolutely nonsense. You can't have an airline that's flying to the, to the Middle East um, with uh, the name Crossair on it, um, for starters. <laughs> and, uh, and there were a number of other reasons. I said also that the whole corporate identity looked like it was, was designed on the back of a so soggy move and pick napkin. Um, so the CEO invited me to Basel to talk to them and to really say that, you know what, we're not so bad after all. And, uh, and, you know, this is a fantastic company. And, you know, what are your thoughts? And I told him, and I said, I think you have to aim high. And I think that you can never underestimate the consumer. And Switzerland is shorthand for so many things, but it is shorthand for, I think, quality and security. Um, and, and I think a very, very specific international point of view, and one which, as a Canadian, I relate to, and I think that we think of the, the challenges that we have with two official languages, um, having spent enough time in Switzerland, a nation with four official languages, um, is something altogether different. And we went away, and they invited 50 agencies um, to, to pitch to create the new brand. And uh, 50 became 20, became eight, and we were invited to the process. And, Eventually, um, we won, and it was a rather extraordinary, um, it was the 13th of, of January that we actually got this business, and it was interesting because at the same time, in, in parallel, AOL Time Warner had bought IPC uh, Media, and uh, this is just a cautionary tale for everyone. Um, when 
selling wallpaper to Time Inc. was one thing. Um, and then things started to change with AOL Time Warner. Um, but then when they brought in IPC and, um, and the first conversation I had with the particular uh, gentleman I was reporting to, uh, we sat down at the American bar at the Savoy and he said, do you know what, the two of us were very, very alike. And he came from a magazine called Smash Hits and I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with it, but it's, um, it's basically, it's a, it's a teen pop lifestyle magazine and that's where he really made his name. And he said, the great thing with wallpaper and my background editing a teen magazine is that wallpaper you never would have to say, you know, Swedish architect X, and then describe their building project. You just name the architect. And he said, this, it was absolutely the same for us. We would talk about the Bay City Rollers, and we would never have to say that the Bay City Rollers <laughs> were that pop group in the 70s who had to wear plaid. And I thought, as I wandered back down the strand, I thought, this really is not going to work. <laughs> and I uh, spent my Christmas um, in Switzerland with my mom, and. Um, and really, uh, I think, took stock of the world and obviously knew that we were in the, pro you know, we were in the pitch process to get this business. And it was, it was rather extraordinary that um, the call came through and we were asked to uh, go and uh, build this new airline. And, and I think it was, I guess for me, the point of departure, really. I was at the gate and I thought we'd landed this exceptional piece of business and I think I had by then mentally sort of left wallpaper. And um, it was only a month ago um, that I actually handed in my note. Well, I handed in my notice in January when I got back from holiday. And uh, as soon as we, we got the, the, as soon as the, the contract arrived from the airline. And, and it's really been, I guess, about five months now, 37 lawyers. Um, and, uh, and finally, um, a divorce, uh, which is uh, where we are right now. Uh, the exciting bit is that uh, I move forward with um, an agency, uh, which obviously are doing all the things that I discussed, um, but also a new company, which will be headquartered in Switzerland. Uh, and there are obviously advantages to being based in Switzerland that we all know. Um, but the, the flip side to that as well is, is an opportunity, because you sometimes wonder, um, you sit out there and you sort of assess what you're doing. And, and when you're free from something, suddenly the calls start pouring in. And I think of a lot of the morning session this morning was talking um, about and focusing on um, geopolitical aspects of, um, of our current situation. Uh, I'm quite interested in going back to news now. Uh, and I think that uh, one thing that we will be doing, and, and again, I've sat at home over the weekend at mom's house just flipping the channels and watching things. Uh, there's really room, I think, and I think this nation in particular has an enormous opportunity sitting in North America, I think, to press forward um, and to, to be, I think, the last beacon of quality when it comes to media on this continent. Uh, we're obviously um, actively building a plan right now to get back into the news business print-wise, um, and, and I, I, you know, discussing hard news here uh, and business coverage. Um, that there's room to do something, obviously, um, in radio, but I think also ultimately uh, in television. And that's where our interests will be focused. And I think that it's, if you look at the state and what's become of, I think, news gathering and the fact that there's so many bureau closures and just having the one person uh, you know, in Jerusalem and then the next closest correspondent happens to be sitting in London or perhaps that person in Jerusalem was thrown on an El Al flight that morning just to get them out there to make it look good, um, I don't think is, is the way forward. And I firmly believe that to get that, I think we have to encourage the reader, the viewer, um, that they might have to participate on a level. Um, they might have to pay a little bit more for it, but I don't think that we can continue um, to shovel people the same nonsense that is being served up to them. And I'm not only referencing this continent, but I'm, I'm talking internationally because I think the same thing is happening in the UK as is happening in Germany, as is happening in Italy at the moment. Um, so I think on one side, um, while I think our business is obviously is going to be focused on, and I would say if my last you know, six years have been about chronicling brands and reporting on them, I think it will really be focused on, I think, innovating and building new ones media-wise. But that will probably be a vehicle, though, only to, I think, look at innovating and developing a new 
quality, intelligent, um, and I think unswervingly upmarket uh, global media brand. So watch for it. Thank you very much. <laughs>